When you look at a map of a fantasy world, one of the things that leaps out of it and slaps you in the face is the towns and the cities. They are the places where people live and therefore the places where the majority of the story will probably take place, or at least the places that will deeply influence a lot of the story. Some of the fantasy towns stick in our mind even more than our own world towns and cities. But how do you do that? How do you build a truly memorable town in a fantasy world? Today, let's talk about that. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. In this video, I'm going to talk about the life of towns, how they get started and how they become either cities or eventually die. If you like this kind of fantasy world building content, be sure to hit the subscribe button down below if you haven't already. If you like what I do here, consider supporting my work either by going to Ko-fi and my page there or by buying my book, The Hidden Blade, available in the link below from Amazon. If you want to join my community of world builders, I do have a Discord server link down below. And let's get cracking with today's video. First, let's talk about towns built on the basis of resources. The first towns in our world probably came into existence because of a surplus of agricultural resources. As our farming methods improved, specifically with the addition of domesticated animals, our output of food improved. And as the output of food improved, people farmed more than they needed for just their families. And that surplus required storage. It required a place to trade it for other things that you want. And slowly specialization was born so that people farmed grain and traded grain for wheat or barley or turnips or pumpkins or whatever else they traded for. And that form of trade gave birth to probably the first towns. This is all wild speculation. I could be wrong, but that is how I understand the anthropological models around the very beginning of towns. So one of your initial resources around which to build a town is a centralized location for farms. What likely happened is that people initially built their houses close together for protection and farmed their own lands. And then slowly, as I said, as the surplus enables them to trade and to specialize, they stopped farming their own lands necessarily. And some of them just existed to serve others as a trade facilitator or as a storage of grain person and eventually as priests, because that is one of the first things that developed at that point is temples and organized religion. A town that's built from an agricultural base, a town that is a farming town, has a very distinct feel to it. Farmers are obsessed with the weather. I know because I grew up on a farm. In the city, you have a passing interest in the weather. On a farm, it is the difference between making money that year and making a loss that year. It's not just that it needs to rain. It needs to rain at the right time. You need to not get hail when you have crops ripening in the field and then the hail destroys them, which, believe me, happens on a farm. During the off season, when the fields lie fallow, the Weather needs to be correct to refresh the mineral content of the soil as well. And speaking of mineral content, you have to leave the fields fallow and rotate them, as specified in the Bible, not exactly like that, but something like that, in order to give the soil time to recover from the intense methods of agriculture. Uh, of course, these days we can refresh the soil much more efficiently by means of fertilizer and so on. But if you have ever been involved in farming activities, you will understand where a lot of those initial rules come from of rotate your fields, let the field lie fallow and so on, because the minerals get leached out of the soil by farming. So one of the first things to understand about a farming town is that there will be a lot of discussion about the weather and there will be a lot of prediction about the weather. And if you have a magic system that allows for either weather prediction or for weather control, 
those magicians who have this ability will be some of the most celebrated and sought-after denizens of that town. A farming town will want to acquire such a weather worker as a matter of high priority, whether that is attracting them to the town by making it a great place for people like this to live, or whether it is through more forceful means like kidnapping a weather worker and making them work for them, or whether it is through working with a temple, so maybe the temples control all weather workers and weather witches, and they enforce those weather witches to go to towns where it is needed in order to supplement the agriculture of the towns and ensure that the harvest is good. And the other important thing to remember about agricultural towns and weather is that they are not going to be built where the weather is unpredictable or constantly changing. One of the reasons why Africa has so few permanent cities is because Africa's weather pattern is so very changeable. Every few years, the actual weather patterns move around in the location of Africa because it doesn't have big mountain ranges. Big mountain ranges, as far as I understand, I'm not a climatologist, but as far as I understand, big mountain ranges bring stability to weather patterns. And Africa's weather patterns, therefore, are very unstable. So what happens is you farm here in your temporary village, then the weather systems move and with it moves the rainfall. So now you're living in an arid region while a day's travel further south or north or east or west, the new rainfall pattern has started. So you pick up all your people, all your wealth, except the huts themselves, the, the huts of the village, and you move with the weather. And there you build a new village, which I think is actually a very, very interesting model to build a society around is this semi-nomadic culture of you move with the weather, not like a nomadic culture that follows the flock of reindeers as the Sami do in the far north in the Arctic, but a literal following of the weather. Isn't that an interesting thought? Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed learning about the weather and its influence on agricultural towns. The other big resource that you can have to start a town with is, of course, mineral wealth. This is gold, diamonds, silver, brass, zinc, tin. Tin was very critical during the Bronze Age because it was the safest way to make bronze by blending it with brass. And it is actually quite a rare metal. And that's what created the huge trade routes of the Bronze Age, where they would mine the tin in Cronwell in England, up in uh, the, the northern part of Europe, and the tin would come winding its way down to the giant mega civilizations that were all around the Mediterranean and the Near East. What is the difference between a mineral-based town and a agricultural-based town? Well, for one thing, your agricultural base town tends to live longer than your mineral base town. This is simply because unless you live in Africa with its changing weather patterns and its instable weather patterns, agricultural towns are unlikely to experience change leading to town abandonment. Mineral towns only exist as long as the mineral resource is there, unless they diversify enough. So for a great real-world example of this, let's talk about Johannesburg in South Africa. Johannesburg is in a terrible location for a town. It has no water. It has terrible weather. There are hailstorms in Johannesburg where the hailstones are this big. And when they hit a pool, as shown in the clip, there's a literal explosion. But Johannesburg is where it is because of the gold. The seam of gold discovered in Johannesburg was mined for over a hundred years. It runs for kilometers underground. The place is riddled with mine shafts. And when gold was discovered there, 
there weren't big companies that mined the gold. You could mine it as a normal person. You could go and buy a claim from the government and you could start a mining operation for yourself. And this is what led to the initial boom of claims in Johannesburg and people coming to Johannesburg from all over the world to try and get some of this wealth out of the ground. If the mines had not been that deep, Johannesburg would probably have eventually died as many gold rush towns do die. But the gold mines were so deep that companies were formed to mine underground and those companies needed additional serv services. The people who worked for the company needed services, they needed housing. And so Johannesburg became more than just the gold town. And then the bankers moved in to help the companies run, you know, their books and their finances. And security guards formed and there was an airport and the whole town grew into a vast business hub. And by the time the gold ran out, Johannesburg was a firmly established city with a myriad of business interests. Conversely, there are a myriad of ghost towns dotted in America that were resource towns, gold rush towns, that eventually died because the gold ran out and they did not have so much that it required all these other businesses in order to diversify and grow into a city. So when you're building a mineral-based town, bear in mind that it is quite likely that the town will only last as long as the mineral lasts unless the mineral is so much and so sought after that it diversifies into all these other businesses and eventually becomes a city whose past was as a mineral town, but now it is a business hub. And if you enjoyed learning all that about Johannesburg, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about the one thing that a fantasy world can offer you in terms of a town's starting point as a resource town. And that is magic. If you have a magic system where there is magical ore, you can, of course, mine the magical ore. Or maybe your magic system is based on some kind of source of magic that allows power to flow across the land. It would then make sense to have people make a town right there over that resource to kind of direct and control the resource. Bear in mind that if you do that, you will probably have to make this an extremely defensive town. In our world, many wars have been fought over resources. If there are magical resources, things that literally allow you to create magic and magic items, I think the wars for control of those resources and the wars for those towns will be incredibly intense. I think those towns would be highly militarized. So bear that in mind if you're creating towns that are built on top of a magical resource. I think that you should go for a heavy, heavy militarized presence. So those are the three types of resource towns that I can see you having, agricultural, mineral, or magical. There is another reason for a town to exist, and that is trade. So what I mean by this is things like your port towns, where you have a great natural harbor, and so you can launch ships easily, and ships can easily come into your harbor bringing in trade goods. Bear in mind that quite often resources are in bad locations. I just spoke about the fact that Johannesburg is in a terrible location. So having a, so a town will often come to be around a natural harbor because travel by ship is probably the first thing that is invented in terms of trade. By the same token, towns that provide supplies along established trade routes are a very good reason for a town to exist. If you think about the example of Johannesburg, you had to transport the gold from Johannesburg all the way to, say, Durban's Natural Harbor. That means that you needed to cover 600 kilometers with that gold using ox wagons. 
So you wanted to have places where you could have the wagons go for the night, where they would be secure, ca carrying all this gold, and where the people could be resupplied, the oxes could be resupplied, and you could make this journey to the natural harbor in stages. If you put, for example, a great magical resource in the middle of the highland plateau, you're then going to probably have a whole series of towns as the people move the goods to the natural harbor to then export it. And you can either have this along a ox wagon style route, or you could have towns growing up along a river if the river is navigable, if you can use it for a trade route, then people would naturally build towns along a river to resupply the barges drifting down the river. And then the last trade town that can come into existence is towns that are built around trade fairs. So these towns are places where, for example, you have nomadic herders bring their herds to sell to buyers. So once or twice a year, they gather with all their horses and people come to buy horses or their cows and people come to buy cows. Towns like this would, generally speaking, be very sleepy towns, except for those few days when the whole world descends on them with all the money and starts buying animals or starts buying the trade goods of people and there's the whole activity of the fair. And if you enjoyed this discussion of how trade towns can come to be, hit the thumbs up button. There are some other types of towns, things like education towns, Oxford in our world, or The Will on Roke in the Earth Sea World by Ursula Le Guin, which are towns that grew up around a university and offer services to the scholars who participate in that school. Or towns that are built around defensive measures like Minas Tirith in Lord of the Rings that is built to defend the West from the incursions of Sauron and other reasons that are more political in nature than they are organic in that a town would naturally develop here. I use this as well. The capital city of La Roche Duchy, Rokai, isn't even a town. It's a single fortress and it's called a capital city and everybody in my world refers to it as a city, but it is a fortress. And it is in a terrible location. It is so far into the Arctic Circle that there is a period of a week long where it is dark all the time in winter. And in summer, there's a period of about a week where it is light all the time and the sun doesn't set. It is an atrocious location for a capital city, but it is there because it is the primary God against the blood gate. So it needs to be there. And it became the capital city because that's where the Duke lived and so on and so forth. But it never developed into a proper city because it is in a terrible location. So you can have all kinds of weirdnesses that are based around politics rather than the reality of town development. But if you do that, if you build a Rokai, if you build a the will on, on the island of Roke, if you build a Minas Tirith style city, you must bear in mind that you need strong politics to support such a city. And the politics needs to have a long history. Otherwise, it's going to feel tacked on and inorganic to people who interact with your world. And if you like that exploration of how politics can influence town development, hit the thumbs up button. And let's quickly discuss five rules for making towns that don't suck. First, make it a town of something. So give it a name and then an of something. For example, I have Somfa, town of canals. Why is it the town of canals? Because there are magical beasts called gravastos who dig out the canals and these canals have turned Somfa into the trading hub of the empire, despite the fact that it is a landlocked town. And that is what makes Somfa an interesting town. So, town name of something. Give it some unique building elements. The town of Solus in the Dragonlance Chronicles are all tree houses built into the giant Valenwood trees, which is an amazing image 
and really makes the town stand out in my mind. Give it some unique defenses. Minas Tirith will forever be in my mind due to its tiered layers of walls and that giant ship that comes out of the mountain. It is a beautiful defensive town and it serves its purpose as the bulwark against the forces of Sauron. Give it some unique magical components. Trudy Canavan in the Black Magician series, she has magic prop up the buildings. So they built these houses that make no sense. These houses wouldn't stay up without magic. They, they're not strong enough. The architecture doesn't support them well enough. But she puts magic into the buildings and that makes the town this very unique flavor in terms of the inner circle, the university and the noble houses that are all propped up using magic. And finally, this is fantasy. Put it in some unique magical place. Make it a flying city. Make it an underwater city. Make it an underground city. Make it sigil, a donut-shaped city on the top of the infinitely tall tower in the middle of the multiverse, as is done in the D&D setting Planescape. And that is my thoughts on how to make great towns and fantasy settings and how towns are born in general. If you like this video, you will probably enjoy my video on economic models for fantasy worlds, which you can check out over there in the card. And please do remember to hit the thumbs up button and I will see you soon for another video.